Okay, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you please look to the person that's beside you or the person behind you or in front of you? Can you greet them and, and say, Happy Sabbath, I'm so glad you are here. Can you do that, please? Thank you very much. Um, you know, I've, I've been blessed already um, when, when I received the invitation to come up to Kingman, Arizona to, to speak. Um, I had no idea what to expect. I heard we had a church here in Kingman. I knew um, the Zagaras were here because um, I, I've known the Zagaras for, for a while now when they used to be in Texas and El Paso there. Good to see you guys again. Um, and I knew they were here. But I, did, I, I, I driven by here on Interstate 40 many, many times and ha, ha, did not know um, that we had a church here. So when I drove up, and, I, and, I, and by the way, I, when I got here, I was, I was a little surprised to see so many vehicles here at, at, at 9 in the morning. Because in, in, in a lot of Adventist churches, 9 a.m., um, you know, only the deacon's there because he has to. Right? But... Um, the music today, uh, the Sabbath school with, with our young people, um, I've been so blessed. And I want to thank you for, for just uh, being such a, a wonderful uh, musical church. Um, that, that, is, that is worship. You know, when we gather together as a family from all different places to, to come together and, and just um, worship our, our Lord and Savior. And, and I just want to thank you for, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for, for blessing me already. And um, I was told, Pastor Manny, you can preach as long as you want, but we leave at noon. <laughs> um, and, and, and I see that it's already uh, five past noon. So I want to be considerate uh, for those of us that didn't have breakfast. No, I mean for those of you that didn't have breakfast, but... Um, I, I do want to spend some time in, in the Word of God today. Is that okay? Amen. Now, I do want to tell you that I bring greetings from the Arizona Conference Office. I work there with Elder um, Ed Keys, um, El, uh, Elder Reggie Leach, our treasurer, and our brand new um, Executive Secretary, Jorge Ramirez. Uh, we just met him this week. He, he was there uh, for the first time on Monday. He's a great guy. He's, he's, a, he's a bilingual, um, and, and, and I like him already because he took me out to eat, so he's a good guy, <laughs> all right? But I bring greetings from the Arizona Conference Administration, from our team there, and I want you all to know that uh, we regularly pray for, for all our churches, and, and, and about once or twice a year we pray uh, for the Kingman Seventh-day Adventist Church specifically. Um, so... Um, Greetings. Do you guys want to send a greeting back to the people there at the office? Okay, about 13 of you. All right. Um, I am the um, Arizona Conference Youth and Children's Ministries Director. I also um, help with uh, the men's retreat, not necessarily men's ministry, but the men's retreat. I was asked to be a part of that, and, and I've enjoyed doing that. Um, I am also uh, married, like the Bible says. I am uh, the husband of only one wife, okay? Um, I have four daughters, um, ages 22, 20, 18, and 16. So four daughters. Um, I live with five uh, women. Um, I want Jesus to come very soon. Uh, please pray for me. <laughs> uh, we also have two uh, dogs. Who happen to be uh, female as well, um, but it's good to be in Kingman, Arizona today. Uh, this morning, I just want to spend a few moments uh, talking about uh, the importance of having God in the home, God in the family, and I want to share with the church and with every person here today, whether you are single and ready to mingle, whether you are married um, happily or 
you know, married, <laughs> whether you are uh, divorced or, or widowed, uh, these five um, secrets or these five keys to a happy home, they, all, they, they are applicable to every single one of us, okay? Now, how many single people are here? I want to say something specifically to single people, especially those that are kind of, you know, looking for that um, other special person. Okay, I'm just going to say one thing to you before we, we get started, okay? Um, as, you, as you are um, looking out to, to find a person as you're dating or out there, you know, looking for someone, okay, open your eyes really big, okay? Open your eyes. And, and, and if, if, you're, if your close friends or, or your family tells you, hey, you know what? That guy is not good for you. Listen, open your ears. Listen, okay? Now, once you find that special someone and you decide, you know, through prayer and, 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 you, and you feel and, you, and you're convicted that that is a person that God has for you and you take that step of marriage, once you get married, close your eyes. Okay? Just close your eyes. Okay? Because it seems that we do things backwards. When we're dating, when we're looking for that other person, we close our eyes. We don't see those, those, those negative characteristics. We don't see those things that are going to be um, a burden or are going to be stressful or are going to probably end the marriage, you know, because we're so... I am love. And when someone tells us, you know what, that girl may not be the best person for you. Oh, but, but I love her. It's like we close our eyes. We are blinded before we get married. And then once we get married, it's like we open our eyes. My mom told you that you were no good for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, let, let's not do things backwards. So singles that are looking for that special someone, open your eyes right now and listen. And then once you get married, close them, okay? Don't, don't look at the faults. Now, um, I like to look at um, the first key, or, or let's call them principles. The first principle to a happy home is um, found in um, Genesis uh, chapter 2. Verses 21 to 24, and because of time, I'm just going to browse through them, if that's okay. Um, respect. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, when God created uh, the first man and first woman, um, God made them, okay, made them perfect. Right? And, and when God created Eve, he, he took Eve out of Adam's side, out of, out of Adam's rib, Okay? And I love what one pastor um, said. He said he, he didn't take um, Eve out of Adam's foot so he would step all over her. And he didn't take Eve out of Adam's um, skull so that she would try and, you know, be over him. But, but God took Eve out of Adam's side, out of his ribs. So, you know, his side right here, right next to his arm, um, next to the heart. Okay. Right? Other side. So that she would be close to him, close to his heart. And, and, and that illustrates, it symbolizes a, a level of respect. And there's a principle there for a family, for a couple, for a home. Uh, the first principle for a happy home, happy family, is respect. There needs to be a mutual respect. Uh, number two, 1 Corinthians 14.40, uh, Paul writes about order. And he says that God is not a God of chaos. God is a God of order. Therefore, um, the family, the home, needs to have some order. What's another word, with, uh, what's another word for order? It starts with a D and it rhymes with discipline. discipline. Very good. Discipline. Very good. <laughs> discipline. It's another, another name for order. Um, the home, there, there needs to be discipline in the home. There needs to be discipline in the family. 
okay, in, in the marriage, needs to be disciplined. Some of you remember back in the day when um, parents would put their kids to bed around 7 p.m., and then they would go out for a walk around the neighborhood. Remember those days? Today, the kids put the parents to bed at 7 p.m., and then they go out, right? Order, discipline, discipline the home. Uh, number three, gratitude. First Thessalonians 5.18, Paul says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Gratitude. Now, let me, let me tell you something about this. In some of our cultures, some cultures, um, we take our, our mothers for granted, our fathers for granted, our grandparents for granted. I, I am Mexican, okay? I know some of you guys are looking at me and you're wondering, you know, where is he from? He looks French. He looks Italian. I'm Mexican, all right? And, and um, I come from a very traditional Mexican family. My father has a big, you know, handlebar mustache. Uh, he, he speaks very, very little English, broken English. He and my mother both worked full-time jobs when I was growing up. But when I would come home, you know, after school, um, I remember seeing my father come home after a long day of work, and then my mother come home after a long day of work, and my father would come in the house, and where would he go? He would go into the chair, right? He'd go into the chair, turn on the TV, and my mother, she would get home after a long day of work, and where would she go? Into the kitchen. Do you guys know my parents? <laughs> My mother would go right into the kitchen and she'd prepare, you know, supper. And, and I remember uh, growing up, you know, my mother would wash and, and iron our clothes and she would, you know, do everything in the house. Well, at the age of 18, I left home and went to college. I went to school in Mexico. I went to our Adventist University in Montemorelos, Mexico, okay? And down there, um, I learned some things. One of the things that I learned um, the second week being there um, is, is, is how, how wash is done. So after about a week and a half, I ran out of clean clothes and I gathered all my, my, my dirty clothes. I bought some, um, some, um, you know, laundry detergent and I asked, you know, where is the laundry? Where's the laundry? And everybody pointed down the hall that's down there. I said, all right. So I grabbed a whole bunch of coins, right? To go to the laundry. I walked into the laundry and to my surprise, there were no washing machines. There were no dryers. It's a bunch of college students there washing by hand. Chaka chaka con Ariel. Some of you guys know what I'm saying, right? I had to learn how to wash my clothes by hand. And then once you wash your clothes, you had to hang them on a line. And I didn't know, but you were not supposed to leave your clothes overnight out, out on the line. So I, I forgot, I really didn't know the first time. And the next day when I went to pick up my clothes, they were gone. They were stolen. People stole your clothes. So you had to wash your clothes, put them out, and, a, and a, an hour later or so you had to come and make sure, you know, they were still there and then take them. So I had to learn how to wash. I had to learn how to iron my clothes. And sometimes... You had to um, make sure you clean the iron because on Friday nights we'd get hungry and the, the cafeteria was closed and we couldn't go outside off the campus. So we would make quesadillas <laughs> on the iron. So sometimes you'd be ironing your shirt on Sabbath morning and you have cheese all over your shirt. <laughs> so you had to be careful. So I had to learn how to wash my clothes. I had to learn how to iron I had to learn how to make my bed. I had to learn, you know, all these things. So, so my first Christmas vacation, I went home after being in college, you know, for a few months, first semester. And for the first time, now remember, I am now 18 years of age. But for the first time in my life, I noticed all the work that my mother did for us on a daily basis at the age of 18. So we're sitting down during one of our meals, and I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. My mother didn't even sit down with us 
at the meal. She would be going from the stove to the table, bringing the tortillas. You know, she'd be heating up the tortillas and bringing them and bringing out whatever we needed. And I, I remember watching my mother and, and, and thinking, is this, is, I mean, she's always done this. How come I never noticed this? So I needed a spoon and I was about to get up to grab a spoon. And my mother said, what do you need? I said, mom, I, I, I'll get it. I just need a spoon. She said, no, no, no. And before I could say or do anything, she had already grabbed the spoon and put it right there on the table. And I said, mom, thank you so much. And I, you know, I, I use a spoon. Well, after we finished the meal, we all got up from the table and my mom went to wash dishes. And my father got up and went where? Back on the chair, right? So I remember um, walking over to my mother and I put my arm around her. I gave her a kiss in the cheek. And I said, Mom, gracias. I said, gracias, thank you for the meal. And she looked at me and, and she started crying. And I said, Mom, why are you crying? I said, Mom, why are you crying? And she said, Son, that's the first time that you have ever said thank you to me for a meal. You know, we take for granted. We take for granted what, what, our, what our families do for each other, what our parents do. Um, children that are here. Kids, young people, young adults, um, say thank you regularly. If you already do that, if you've been raised in a home where, where you were taught since you were little, you know, what do you say? Thank you. You know, that's great. If not, it's never too late to start. You can start today. Start saying thank you. And then you can also throw in that other word, please. Please. Um. Husbands, when was the last time you thanked your spouse, your wife, for the clean socks? Every time you open that drawer, there they are, clean socks. When was the last time that wives, that you thanked your, your husband for, for always leaving the toilet seat down? <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe I'm getting, in some, I'm getting some men into trouble here. Okay, I'll stay away from that. But, you know... 1 Thessalonians 5 says, um, Be thankful in, in all things, for this is God's will. It is God's will that we have hearts of gratitude towards each other in the home. And that will grow. Imagine, imagine families that say please and thank you and that appreciate each other. Imagine communities that appreciate each other. Imagine churches that appreciate each other. And it, it doesn't take a whole lot. You don't need a big budget to say please and thank you. Number four, my favorite, love. 1 John 4, 8. I do want to read this one. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. This is um, a very well-known passage. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Love. There, th this, is, this is crucial in the home, in the family. But Pastor Manny, I live alone. This is also for you. Love those around you. And how do we love? There's many, many ways. Um, I, I, I've told you, I've, I've been blessed already being here, worshiping with you. you, know, you, you this church signed a, a card and sent it to John, who was about to get surgery. That is a beautiful way to demonstrate love. Cards, a little text, a phone call. Hey, you know, I grew up in a very macho Mexican house. My father never said the words, I love you, to me, ever, ever. To this day, I don't think my father has ever said those words to me. And I thought I was okay. 
I thought that, that that didn't matter. But I've learned that some of the reasons why I am the way I am and why I'm so rough at times with my family is simply because I did not know or feel that my father loved me. So I made it a point with my girls, not a day goes by that I don't let them know that I love them. I, I, I called um, my oldest daughter, who um, she's in college right now, and I woke her up this morning because I was driving, you know, at six in the morning to come up here. So I called her, and, and she's like, Dad, what are you doing so early? And I said, I just called to, to say that I love you. She's like, oh, Dad, thanks. I love you too, but let me go back to sleep. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll call you later. But, you know, um, love. Love in the home. When was the last time, husbands, when was the last time that you grabbed your, your wife, put your arms around her and gave her one of those passionate kisses like in the movies? When was the last time you did that? When was the last time that you came home with, with flowers? Wives, when was the last time that you cooked that special dish that your husband loves? Kids, sons and daughters, when was the last time that you went up to your mom and gave her a big hug and gave her a big kiss? You know, these demonstrations of affection, hugs and kisses, we need more of that in the home. We need more of that. I remember uh, someone said, oh, Pastor Manny, you know, I, I, I don't kiss my wife in front of my children. And I said, why not? Oh, that's not appropriate. So I said, do you fight with your wife in front of your children? Do you argue with her in front of your children? Oh, so it's okay to argue and fight, but it's not okay to show affection. Kiss, hug. Hug your kids. Kiss your kids. Hug each other. Um, a few weeks ago, actually it was last month, we did a, a youth retreat there at Prescott, and, and, and some of the young people here were there. And on Saturday morning, uh, we had a group go out with signs saying, free hugs. And, and they were just walking around the town square giving free hugs to people. Uh, these young people came back with, with some wonderful testimonies. There were, there were not a whole lot of people. There were some individuals that actually uh, broke down and cried simply because a total stranger went up to them and gave them a hug. We're living in a world where love has been traded for lust and for other things. As, as Christians, as Adventist homes, we need to bring back God's love in the home. Now, you all are familiar with... Um, the five love languages, right? Uh, Gary Chapman's uh, five love languages. You're familiar? Okay, so this morning I want to share with you the five love languages according to Pastor Manny Cruz. Okay? Five love languages according to Pastor Manny Cruz. Words of affirmation. Your tacos are delicious. <laughs> Acts of service. I made you tacos. <laughs> Receiving gifts. Here's a taco. <laughs> Quality time. Let's go out for tacos. And physical touch. Let me hold you like a taco. <laughs> we need love in the home. Last but not least... Um, Psalm 127, verse 1, which was our scripture reading this morning. Unless the Lord builds a house, it's labors, labor in vain. We cannot, we cannot be happy without God. We cannot have a happy marriage without God. We cannot have a happy family without God. We cannot have a happy home without God. God needs to be at the center of our home. This weekend... This weekend, praise God that the world, the Christian world, is remembering the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Praise God for that. And yes, we should take advantage of these opportunities. We, we should celebrate Easter. Yes. At the same time, I would like to go a step further. We should celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every day in our homes. Some of us come to church on Sabbath, and yeah, we sing, yeah, you know, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but during the week, we live lives like if Jesus Christ was still dead in the tomb. Let us celebrate the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ every single day. I want to close sharing a, a brief testimony. You know, I, I am very blessed. I, I married a fourth generation Seventh Day Adventist. My wife, um, you know, her grandfather is in the history books, both um, in the medical field and in the Adventist history books. Uh, my my wife's grandfather was the first African American uh, doctor to do a, um, I believe, a residency at, at Los Angeles General Hospital. He's in the history books. He's also uh, the first African-American missionary that the Seventh-day Adventist Church sent from the U.S. to Africa. Okay? So she's like Adventists, you know, from head to toe. Was raised on haystacks and all that. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I came into the church as, as a 17-year-old. Okay? Um, I, I was not born in the church. How many of you were born in the church? Okay, I was born in a hospital, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> So my wife, you know, is, is a four generation Adventist, and, and we, 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 since we got married, we, we agreed that we would have family worship every day. And, and by the grace of God, and really because of her, I'm going to be honest, you know, I, I, I am supposed to be the priest of the house, but many times it has been my wife who has taken that leadership role, and she's the one that has led out in, in that family worship. But we have worship every morning. And... I, I, I told you the ages of my daughters. Um, as I talk to my daughters, um, you know, throughout the week, on the phone, or, or the ones that are still at home, the thing that they thank my wife and I the most is, is not necessarily that we brought them up in a Christian church, even though they do, they are thankful for that. But the, the number one thing that they are most thankful for it's family worship. They say, Mom, Dad, you know, um, no matter where we've been, no matter where we are, no matter where we go, you know, those moments, those moments praying together as a family ha have been such a blessing. I didn't realize that. Honestly, for me, family worship doesn't do a whole lot. I was being selfish. Family worship is not necessarily for me as a father. Family worship is for the family. And, 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 and I, you know, I wish I could go back in time when my girls were little so I could make family worship more dynamic and more fun. I can't do that. What I can do is make family worship more dynamic and fun now. Which is, what I, which is what I do. So, before I close, before I pray, I would like to challenge every person that is here today. Whether you live by yourself, whether you live just you and your spouse because you're empty nesters, whether you are um, a divorcee and you live you know, with family or you live alone, whether you have a, a family unit, whatever your case may be, okay? You can always begin a worship in your home. You can establish an altar in your house where, where prayer is, 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 is offered every morning and every evening the way the Israelites did. The morning and evening sacrifice. So this morning... I want to challenge each person here today. Go home. Go home today and start family worship. Whether it's by yourself or with your spouse or whoever. 
start family worship. If you're doing it already, praise God. Do not let a single day go by without having that morning and evening sacrifice. But it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start. God is such an awesome, wonderful, loving God that no matter what we've been through, no matter what we have done, no matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how messed up our past is, no matter how bad as parents as we've been, the moment we decide, God, today I want to begin with you, God says, okay, I've been waiting. So today I challenge each one of us to start worship in our homes. Is there anyone here that would like to say today, God, with your help, I'd like to begin to pray with my family. I want to begin family worship at home. Is there anyone here that would like to do that by a show of hands? Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be called your sons and your daughters. We thank you, Father God, for the opportunity that we've had here today to gather as a family and to worship you. Thank you, God, for the blessings you give to us each and every day, even though we don't deserve them. Today, God, as we decide to begin family worship, as we decide to make you the center of our home, of our family, of our lives, we invite the Holy Spirit to guide us in that decision. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for loving us the way you do. We love you, too. And we want Jesus to come soon. Until he does, keep us faithful. For we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.